Nancy Grace here, and I want to thank you so much for sending in your questions uh, about the new book, Don't Be a Victim, which means a great deal to me. So without further ado, let me start with Keith on Facebook. Keith asks, what made you think of the title, Don't Be a Victim? Now, that's a good story. Um, let me tell you what happened. I made a friend back in, oh gosh, it had to be the early 2000s, um, maybe 99. So that is when I would started guest hosting for Larry King, the great Larry King. And any night he didn't like a topic, I'd say, I do it. Uh, it he didn't really like covering crime, so I was lucky I got to host the Larry King show when he didn't feel like doing a topic or didn't feel well or he had a, a conflict. So I was really, really blessed to get to do that. Anyway, I walked off the set one night and at that time, Larry King, of course, is still living in El out in California and I tape in New York. So I was at the Penn Station studio I walked out into the green room and there was a little old man that looked like a little elf with um, reddish cheeks and literally sparkling blue eyes and white hair. And he went, oh, you're Nancy Grace. I'm such a big fan. I watch court TV all the time. So I had nowhere to go. I knew nobody in New York. By then, I guess it was like 10 o'clock at night when the Larry King show would end. So I sat down in the green room on a sofa and started talking to this little old man. His name was Joe Feinberg. And from then on, we would text and email, and whenever he would be in town, I would meet him for dinner or lunch, or he'd come to court TV. We stayed friends over all the years. He knew my children very well, and as a matter of fact, um, when I, he was from Miami, when I would leave dropping them off at, you know, quarter of eight in the morning, I would call Jay Feinberg to see how he was. He's a big cook. We compare recipes, uh, very politically crazy, and um, he'd always go off on political tangents. But long story short, one day I was jogging trying to jog before I had to go pick up the twins. And I called Jay Feinberg on the phone, and we were talking as I was jogging. And I was telling him about my idea for the book. And I guess at this point he had to be, I don't know, 85 years old. And um, I was really missing my dad a lot, who had just passed away and going through a rough patch. So I called Jay Feinberg even more. And I, he said, well, what are you trying to convey? He came up with a lot of horrible names, by the way. And I said, I'm trying to tell people how don't be a victim. And I stopped. And I went, that's it. It's going to be don't be a victim. And I remember that moment when Joe Feinberg and I were talking on the phone. And for the next two years, I worked on the book. Joe turned 87. And just as the book went to printing, Joe passed away. But I feel that he's smiling right now. I can just see him. And if you didn't know, that was Joe from Florida that would call in to Court TV and HLN and all the time. Sometimes he would even, Jackie, did you know sometimes he'd even use a fake name? And I'm like, Joe, I know it's you. I know you're Joe from Florida <laughs> asking questions. So, yes, I was jogging and, and brainstorming with an 87-year-old friend from Florida and came up with the name. That's it. Don't be a victim. Raymond on Facebook. Where can we get the new copy, the new book, and when does it come out? Let me tell you. You can go online to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books, uh, Books, uh, uh, Books a Million. Excuse me, I was trying to think of Indie Bound. 
um, Powell's, Target. Will you look up our list, please? Or you could go to nancygracebook.com and it tells you all the outlets that are selling the book. And I am just so grateful to them. Uh, the book came out September 22. And I'm just so proud. I'm so proud of the book because, um, as you know, all my proceeds, all of it, is going to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And I appreciate every single person that buys the book because it will help me make the donation to them that they so desperately need to fight the good fight. Um, so it's Amazon, Books A Million, Barnes and Nobles, Powell's, I, I, I can't read your lips. Indie Bound. There's another, there were six on that list. Target. Yes, how could I forget Target? I practically raised the children, the floor of Target. Uh, but you can go to nancygracebook.com and it gives you all the information. So thank you. Sylvia on Facebook, what was the inspiration for your book? That's a good question, Sylvia. You know, after my fiance was murdered uh, just before our wedding, I did not think I would be able to carry through with my plan of teaching Shakespearean literature. My world exploded. It, it, it's like putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. It's never going to be the same. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I dropped out of school. I couldn't eat. It's terrible. I finally did go back to school with the goal of becoming a felony prosecutor, a crime fighter. That led me into the world, a world I knew nothing about, and that is violent crime. I knew nothing about it till Keith's murder. I grew up in a very rural area in middle Georgia on a red dirt road uh, and a house my grandfather and uncle built for my mom and my grandfather dug the well in the backyard. I didn't know anything about so much hate and anger, but I learned. As a felony prosecutor, I learned a lot. I, coincidentally, really, it's a fluke that I ended up on TV. I had sat on a panel of so-called legal experts in New York while I was a prosecutor, and I sat between Johnny Cochran and Roy Black, the great lawyer, and got into a huge fight with the two of them, of course. And they asked me what I do, and he say, she say, Cochran and Grace, and I said, no. <laughs> I've got a serial rape I'm prosecuting next week. I can't think about TV. And I left and came back to prosecute. Well, my elected DA, who was like a grandfather to me, finally retired after 37 years. And I was out of a job. So I called Court TV back and took the job and moved to New York. I began covering cases and very very much want to do something about them, not just cover cases or, God forbid, read scripts day in, day out. That is why I continued crime fighting by trying to solve unsolved homicides and find missing people, highlight cases that need our help. This is part of my mission, to protect people from becoming crime victims. This book, although it is based on cases I investigated, prosecuted, or covered, is not to scare anyone, but to arm you with facts and evidence and truth so you don't be a victim. That was my inspiration to write this book. I will also tell you that I was very deeply moved when I met the Long Island jogger, as she is called, Karina Vetrano's father, Phil, and learned about Phil and his beautiful wife that suffered so much when Karina was murdered. Um, that led me to investigate the chapter of Safe While Exercising, one of the chapters in here. Elevator assaults. 
the inspiration for that chapter was the Fulton County Courthouse Massacre. I was on a plane from New York to California for a victim's rights march. And as I was putting my suitcase overhead, I got a text that there had been a mass shooting at the Fulton County Courthouse. I got my bag down and marched right off the plane, left LaGuardia and went to JFK and got on another plane to Atlanta. It took many days to process the scene at the Fulton County Courthouse where several of my dear friends were murdered. But the entire thing started when a lady sheriff was overpowered on an elevator. And the massacre continued there after that. That led me to the elevator assault chapter. Safe in your home, <laughs> I was inspired to write safe in your home after a case where uh, a young anchor out of Arkansas was home invaded, raped, and murdered because she had left her, well, it's not because she left it open, but she had reportedly left her Dutch door open. You know those doors that you can close the bottom and open the top? That's a Dutch door. She had left it cracked on the bottom so her pet could come in and out. Uh, that, among many others, led me to that chapter. I mean, it goes on and on. The camping and RV chapter where I cover that plus travel safety abroad, domestic, cruise ships, south of the border. Um, after I investigated the case of Samantha Koenig, uh, an Alaskan barista who was kidnapped from a coffee stand and murdered, she was murdered by an infamous serial killer, Israel Keys, who bragged he found many of his victims or he went hunting for them in campgrounds. Our family's big on camping and RVing. My children and myself can start a fire, pitch a tent in the dark, which I do not advise, uh, cook off of a parking lot with a Dutch oven or on, out of a hole you dig in the ground. Coals, fire, you name it. But how do you stay safe from human predators while you're camping or RVing? So every chapter in this book, including cyber crimes, staying safe, um, have elderly, my mother that lives with me now, every chapter is inspired by true life. And I learn from it how to keep you safe and empower you don't be a victim. Oh, here's a good one. Matt from Facebook. Have you stayed in contact with any of the families of victims you cover? Yes, very many of them. In fact, that's funny. Just this morning, I was emailing back and forth with the fiance of a murder victim in Atlanta I prosecuted the case. Now, in that case, two guys, violent felons, had just gotten out of jail. Just got out of jail. And what did they do? Creep through an area, very fancy area of Atlanta, find a man and a woman toasting their engagement with champagne on the patio. And while most people would go, oh, that's so sweet, they went up attack them, pistol whip them, kill the groom, try to rape the woman. She gets away, runs for her life. I will never forget her testifying in court about she had on what they called espadrille shoes. And she was running up and down stairs in the apartment trying to sneak like in a movie and get away from them. I was just texting with her, emailing with her this morning. So yes, I'm in contact with people, families, not only the ones I tried, but the ones I covered. You get so close to people uh, in crisis situations, 
And I, I guess that's what bonds you together so tightly. Jan, email. How do you have time to write a book when you're already hosting podcasts, mothering twins, being a wife, taking care of your mom? It's amazing, and congratulations to you. Oh, what a sweet email. <laughs> How do I have time? That's what these things are. They're called dark circles <laughs> because I don't have time, but I was very dedicated, and the book means a lot to me. Not because I'm making money off of it. My money's going to National Center Missing and Exploited Children. You can count on that. But because of what I want the book to do, just think about it. If one parent follows this advice on keeping your children safe from cyber threats, if one child is saved from being molested or kidnapped, it was worth it. One victim saved, totally worth it. I can't just stand by and report or on stories and, as I said earlier, God forbid, just read scripts like a, a computer, like a robot. I want to do something about it. Don't you? Um, back to Jan. How do I do it? Well, okay. I typically wake up between 4 and 5 a.m. And I am not a morning person. I'm a night owl. But I like to, um, Jackie here in the studio is probably laughing because she gets emails at about 5 o'clock in the morning. I hope they don't make a sound like, bing, oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, with crime ideas and stories I think we should cover. Um, so I get a really early start. And I've got to give a lot of credit to my three crock pots because I prep their meals usually the night before and plug them in. I know a lot of people think that's lazy. You know what? It's a home-cooked meal with veggies, okay? So it counts, okay? So chew on that. Um, I like to be free when I finally see them at the end of the day. And you know I am pick picking them up and dropping them off at school, okay? I am not letting some babysitter that I don't know that well drive my children around. That is not happening. So I like to be free to devote myself to them when they get home. Um, my husband, I've got to say, he gets all the credit. He's such a great sport. When I have a success, he's happy. <laughs> when I have a hard time, he is too. So he really supports me all the way, you know. He, tries to make things easy for me. In fact, he made this cup of tea. Of course, that was about how many hours ago? Seven or eight hours ago. I still keep heating it up in the microwave thinking I'm going to drink it. Anyway, I guess I'm just blessed because I love hard work and I'm on a mission that gives me energy to keep going. And another thing that has inspired me just as the window was closing, I mean, closing, closing, cl got pregnant. And now I have the twins, and they have really changed my life and given me a, a new lease on life. I, I'm so full of a joy I never had, and I want everyone to be able to protect their children the way I want to protect mine, and that's one of my inspirations. Time, I don't know, gosh. I do work all the time and I do multitask and I actually hate to waste one minute. I like to be doing something at all times. So, Mason email. How do you stay so positive when dealing with crime all day, every day? You know, Mason, that's a very good question. And I think, I've been asked that before, but the more I think about it, I think it's your outlook. Because yes, I remember, my, my best recollection of the first time I got so overwhelmed with the case, I um, was prosecuting case of a little girl, she's about this long, maybe that long. She's about two years old and she was in a vegetative state. 
She had been uh, beaten. She was in a coma. She had cigarette burns all over her from child abuse. And I remember I tried to get medical records from the hospital. And because of HIPAA, I, I couldn't get them. I tried every trick in the legal trick in the book. They would not give me the records. Well, somehow, as we were in trial, it was a bench trial, by the way, the medical records showed up. I'm like, well, you know, that's a day late and a dollar short, but I'll, I'll look at it. And I was looking through. I couldn't use any of it because I hadn't give it, given it to the other side in advance. But I was just looking through it to see what I could learn in court as the defense attorney droned on and on. And I saw where the little girl had been raped. She had been molested. She was this big. And I thought about what the, this child had lived through in life. What her short life was. And I was so upset it was the only time in over 10 years of prosecuting felonies that I asked to be excused from the courtroom. There was not a jury. If there had been a jury, I wouldn't have done it. It was a bench trial. So I left. I got it together. I came back in. But that day as I was driving home, I remember it was raining, pouring rain. I had made it three blocks from the courthouse. I had to pull over and put my head down and just cry about what people do to each other. Now, typically, that doesn't happen, and I'll tell you why. It's the way I look at it, I guess. I don't turn away from the truth, no matter how difficult the facts are, but my eye is on the prize. The prize is getting justice. To me, justice is the truth. Yeah, I may be unhappy with a verdict or a sentencing, but to me, justice is seeking and getting the truth of a case and representing crime victims. So I try really hard, especially after I pick the twins up, to turn it off. And when I do consider cases, which is all the time, I think about how do you prove a case? What are the obstacles? What's the forensics? Do the witnesses jihost? Do they line up or jive their testimonies? Is there a conflict? Who's lying? Every minute detail of a case matters to me. And I focus on those facts, those details, and what, if anything, I can prove from them. So I look at the cases a different way. But I'm like everybody, I just I used to keep two boxes of clean eggs uh, on the set at CNN's HLN, and I have it here as well in case the facts become too much to, to take. How do you stay positive? Because of my outlook. Julie on Facebook, what is the most memorable case you write about in your book? Julie! That's like asking me to pick which is my favorite child. I don't have a favorite. I really don't. My children are so different. It's like the sun and the moon. Which one is more wonderful? They're, they're both wonderful and beautiful in their own way. Um, I can tell you there are a lot of cases in here you've probably never heard of before because so many cases of the high-profile ones have been analyzed to heck and back and don't necessarily prove a point. Some of them, the point I'm trying to make, some of them do. But many of these cases are cases that I actually investigated and tried as a prosecutor and have covered over the years. Um, for instance, the one chapter nobody wants to think about is protect in your protecting your child section. Bathroom attacks. Nobody wants to think about a little child, so say four or five years old, going in a bathroom by themselves and being molested. 
I don't want to think about that. And can I tell you, when you have twins and you're trying to control a four-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl in a public bathroom, let's just say at LaGuardia, that's not easy because I've got running through my mind what can happen in the bathroom. The case that inspired me on that chapter is a little boy you may have never heard of, but I'll never forget his name, Matthew Checky. Out of California, his family was having a big reunion at a public beach picnic area, and his aunt took him to the bathroom and waited outside. I think Matthew was about nine-ish, and he didn't come out, he didn't come out. A guy murdered him in there, and she had taken him to the bathroom. And that is why, even to this day, I usually have John David go into a family bathroom. I wait outside. They're the ones where there's nobody else in there because he refuses to come to the ladies' bathroom with me anymore. Um, but there are methods to protect your child. That chapter was inspired by Matthew Checky. Um, so what I'm saying is there's so many cases that made such a huge impact on me. I can't pick one. There's, there's got to be a hundred or more cases in here that I analyze. I'm sorry, Julie. I feel like I failed you. I'm going to think about that some more. Carol on Instagram, what's your favorite investigation you've done on Fox Nation? Mm. Gosh, Jackie, we've done so many. And what do you want to look into next? Oh, well... It's hard for me to pick one I've already done because I've loved every single one of them in the sense that I, I think we uncover some truths. I'm telling you, investigating the Tiger King story, which is ongoing, that is a piece of work, let me tell you, unlike anything else I've ever seen. But right now, you know what I'm working on? Fort Hood. And I'm putting Fort Hood on notice right now. I don't believe a word you said. Don't get me wrong. I love the military. My father was a veteran. I love the military. That's why I'm so angry about what's happening at Fort Hood. Vanessa Guillen, the beautiful 20-year-old private first class who wanted to go career army, is sex harassed over and over some pervy dude in the army watching her take showers? Ew. And she was afraid to say anything because she was afraid she'd be blackballed and never climb up the ladder. She ends up dismembered, her body burned in a shallow grave after the idiots pour wet cement on her skin. And while her body is being discovered by our friend, um, from Equifax, they find another body, Gregory Weedle Morales from Fort Hood. And now the cases are stacking up. People missing, sex harassed, dead. And I don't believe their story of the investigation about how they tried to figure out what happened to Vanessa. B.S. You can get a kid's private detective kit down at the joke shop and do a better job than they did. For Pete's sake, she was bludgeoned dead in the army. You couldn't find any blood. You couldn't find any evidence. Anything had gone wrong. That's in my next crosshairs. What's happening at Fort Hood? Rita on Facebook. Jackie, what's the best way for her to get a signed copy of the book? Oh. She can still go to nancygrace.com. Yes, go to nancygrace.com, and there is a way for you to order a signed copy. And you can also go to crimeonline.com or Hachette Publishing. It's like hatchet with an E on the end. Hachette Publishing. Um, I'm trying to think of any other way that she could go and get a signed copy because I know nobody's going to the uh, nobody's going to the bookstore right now um, so that's the way to do it is online Grace on Facebook how long did it take to write your book and what did that process look like 
Oh gosh. It took me a little over two years to research and write, don't be a victim. Because I use every case I ever investigated, tried, or covered, and literally talked to thousands of victims to write this book. I remember speaking to one lady. She went to the grocery store. Remember Betty? She went to the grocery store. She had no idea. Uh, Perv was following her and her three little boys from the grocery store to the pharmacy. She leaves the pharmacy, gets in her minivan, takes off, looks in the rearview mirror, and there is a man with a knife back there with her children. Jumps in the front seat, I'm sure to molest her. They get into a war between the gods. She gets slashed all the way across her chest, over her heart. What if that had pierced her heart? This woman, so brave, manages to wrestle with the guy while the minivan's going, kick him out, and run over him. Uh-oh. Anyway, it takes time to speak to crime victims and their families and not just hear their story, but analyze what they're saying so you can call tips and advice and strategy how don't be a victim. The book goes, as I mentioned, I started about how to I protect my child, your child safe at school, at parks, playgrounds, malls, safe while shopping. Remember Adam Walsh? His mom was two aisles away at a Sears and Roebuck when he was kidnapped and murdered. How could she possibly know? There have been times I stupidly would just call out the twins' names and I could hear them answer and think they were okay. That's not smart. Those days ended. Nannies, babysitters, daycares from hell. Not on my watch. Cyber threats on your child, grooming your child, trying to meet your child or exchange X-rated pictures. Safe while you're exercising. I was inspired by Karina Vitrano, the Long Island jogger, to write that. How stay safe when you're shopping. Elevator assaults. Safe in your own home where you should feel safest of all. Safe while you're out driving. What do you do if you think somebody's following you? What if you run out of gas? What if somebody fender benders you? So many things to think about. Crimes at concerts, live events, parties gone wild, safe at bars and restaurants, traveling south of the border, abroad, domestic, cruise ship catastrophes, camping and RV trips. That was important to me. Cyber crimes and security, internet dating, online ads, burglar alarm backfires. I just covered a case where a mom and dad, they flip cars. You know, like, uh, what's the show on HGTV? Flip it, or you flipped it, or flip that house. They do that with cars. They buy a car uh, off a of Craigslist or some other app, and they fix it up and sell it at a profit. The mom and dad, five children, mom and dad go. The guy says, oh, uh, I brought the wrong paperwork. They follow him to his home where he immediately kills both of them to steal the cash they were going to use to pay for the Toyota RAV4. How can you not fall prey to online ads and internet dating? I go into protecting our elderly, our seniors in danger, keeping them safe from attacks, from robocallers, from scams, from scams in text and email form. I use every case at my disposal, not to scare you, but to arm you with knowledge and facts. Don't be a victim. All my proceeds going to National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, and from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you.
Goodbye, friend.